Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Omni Athlete. You're here because like us, you believe that sport is a vehicle for elevating global consciousness. But you know that elevating consciousness through sport only matters if it actually helps you to compete at your highest level. We created this show to empower your performance with the wisdom and techniques of the world's highest achieving mind, body, and spirit competitors. Okay, so today's guest is a former kindergarten teacher turned professional ultra runner who burst onto the professional running scene in 2017 by winning the world's oldest 100-mile trail race, the Western States 100-mile endurance run. She's won the Canyons Endurance 100K, the Rio del Lago 100-miler, where she set a course record, was the first American woman to cross the finish line at the prestigious 2018 106-mile UTMB, and in 2017, she set a new Grand Canyon rim-to-rim-to-rim fastest known time, breaking the previous record by 23 minutes. Beyond her seemingly exponential rise to the top of the ultra-running world, she's brought grit, authenticity, and an awesome amount of transparency to a sport that requires the very best and worst of its competitors to endure the suffering required to transcend the new trials each race brings. She's been featured in elite running outlets like REI, Trail Runner Magazine, and Outside Magazine, and has been as vulnerable as a professional athlete can be in the battle of leveraging, silencing, and living with ego on the road to peak performance. It's my pleasure to introduce to Omni Athlete, Elgato herself, Kat Bradley. Welcome to the show, Kat. <laughs> Hey, thank you. I'm uh, blushing. That was all very nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's all true, and it's really exciting. It, uh, you know, in doing the research for this episode, your journey has is just fascinating. I mean, it, it seems like you've gone through a lot of different evolutions in a really short amount of time. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, reflecting on that, um, I, you know, I of course with the close of every season and with every summer, because you know even as a teacher, that's kind of how my, my years work. The year starts now, like in September right. for me. Um, and as an athlete too, it ends kind of in September. Um, and, uh, so at this time of year, I always tend to reflect and, um, we were just at, uh, this race called the bear 100, which was kind of like my big first coming on to the scene, um, in a small way, but it was kind of where it clicked, like, Oh man, I could maybe, be okay at this and uh we were just at that race and so it's cool reflecting on like the last three three and a half years and how I've grown as an athlete and yeah yeah so one of the the places that I would love to start in that that kind of timeline is you know I I heard you mention in a couple different interviews that your relationship with running when you started right as a high school and college athlete wasn't the same as it is now and it's gone through the, what it sounds like a really interesting evolution. So can you share a little bit about what that journey has been like, like what it was like for you, what that relationship was and what it's become? Totally. Um, so I actually started running, uh, cause I was getting in trouble in school as an eighth grader. I, and so I, I kept getting, you know, sent home, uh, you know, for silly reasons. Uh, and they were like, okay, you have to join a sport. So mm. this hopefully will keep you out of trouble. And, um, <laughs> So I joined the, uh, or I tried out for the JV volleyball team and I got cut pretty much immediately. Um, you know, I'm, I've been the same height. I'm five, nine. I've been the same height, you know, probably since I was 11, 12. So I was just like, so awkward and gawky yeah. and uncoordinated throwing it <laughs> myself, got cut immediately, joined the cross country team. And, um, was first like pretty awful. I remember breaking 30 minutes was a really big deal for me. And then, um, <laughs> But I like got addicted to the vast improvements I made in that first year. And it like gave me an outlet, um, you know, kind of that outlet that I was using in, to be a naughty kid, you know, I got to use it running. And then I progressed really quickly and um, I graduated high school in Hawaii. So I was a big fish in a small pond. So I, you know, it felt good to be hot shit, <laughs> you know, excuse my language. <laughs> high school That's all good. so then and, you know and I was really addicted to that feeling and then I went to college and it just I, I um, ran for D1 school and it, it was super hard and I actually um, ended up leaving the team and you know I was running for reason you know fulfilling that ego mostly that you know it really was mostly that and I didn't really understand why I liked it on a on a different level, you know, all I could 
uh, you know, the winning part was tangible to me. And, mm. you know, the other things that running could give me weren't tangible. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's how, that's something that develops with maturity. And I was just too young to kind of realize what a gift it was. And then, so I quit the team and quit running completely. Um, mm. And uh, like, didn't run a step and got really immersed in the outdoor industry. I um, okay. actually left school and hiked the Appalachian Trail. Um, wow. And uh, that was like my first exposure to the outdoors at all. And I just kind of jumped right in and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Only thing that might have been harder is UTMB. <laughs> but I am. Um, uh, I uh, just uh, started backpacking um, and became a backpack guide. And uh, then it kind of introduced me to the world of the the guiding, um, mm. the guiding industry. So I became a certified backpack guide, raft guide, canoe guide, and a ski guide, assistant wow. ski guide. And it was just really really cool and then um moved to colorado in 2013 and then just um finished school and before that and just kind of saw someone running on the trails once and or decided to like go out for a trail run without realizing it was trail run running (laughs) and it kind of you know then i started signing up for races and um with my friend sean that i went to school with and it was this really cool you know, combination of like running and the reasons why I love the outdoor industry. And then, but I was still raft guiding and I was still, um, uh, skiing and running was like low on the totem pole. So I'd literally hop into these races and I've been like, shoot, I haven't run a step in six months. You know, I have to run 50 miles and I'd go and it would just destroy me and I'd get injured and, but like still love, you know, I just, It was so fun and the community was great and I'd just go and it was just, it was completely comical, like no running. And then I would just go do this race. And then, um, then I moved down to Boulder when I met Ryan in 2015. And, um, I, uh, again, I had the bear 100 on my calendar and I had no training for it. It was like one of those things when he and I met, my arms were bigger than my legs and my legs were the size of my arms now because I just had rafting muscles. It was so funny. Um, (laughs) but I was in good shape, just not running shape. And then, uh, and then I ran the bear and I was like, maybe I should focus on running a little bit more. Um, (laughs) and when I moved down to Boulder, you know, skiing and rafting is a lot less accessible. So it's just a natural progression. And it's a lot easier when you're teaching full time to hop on a trail for a run than hop in a boat. (laughs) (laughs) It's really, it's really interesting because I think there is, you know, there's so much pressure as a collegiate athlete, right? The, the experience of, of the sport that we're pursuing, whatever the sport is, becomes less about at times, right? Whether intentional or not, it becomes less about, let's just find a way to really love this pursuit. Like, let's just love what we're doing and at times becomes just about whether it's winning, whether it's maintaining your spot on the team, whether it's, you know, not letting down whatever belief you have about yourself. Like there, there's just this really weird mix, right? And I think there's always a critical point in every collegiate athlete's life or any athlete even if like, yeah. even if you're not winning things, but you're chasing PRs and stuff and get yeah. addicted to that. I think there's this like breaking point and or you're, it'll either make or break you, yeah. you know, you'll get to that point and then you'll you know, to start feeling burnout because you're running for the wrong reasons and you're not loving the process and you're just loving the results. Then eventually when that happens, the results don't come and it defines you. And then you, you have to go through that and you have to get to rock bottom. Then you either come out of it and you're like, running's not for me. Or you come out of it this like a new athlete, like, and that really, yeah. and I've gone through a cu- couple of these new rebirths of an athlete, you know, two that I can think of. And, uh, that was one of them. And I think, um, that, you know, every single athlete has to go through that at some point. What's been the other one? Pretty recently, actually, it was after I won, um, Western and, uh, you know, everything changed. I wasn't teaching anymore. And I, um, you know, I was like, okay, running's my job. That's yeah. super cool. You know, but then I, again, I started chasing podiums and, doing races that didn't necessarily inspire me. Um, and then, you know, it, I had a bunch of health stuff too. It's hard to say which came first, like a chicken and an egg situation. Yeah. But, um, 
then, you know, I just took six weeks off running and I was like, you know, when I got back into it, I really, you know, I was more out of shape than I've been in three years. And it was really cool to rebuild. And when you're out of shape, you don't have any pressure. So it was, it was good. And, um, then I was able to like, well, that's why I had to kind of cram UTMB training. I yeah. did like two weeks of training, three maybe. <laughs> and, um, wow. and, uh, yeah, three weeks of training. And, um, but like, it was all fun stuff. And I think that's why I was able to get reasonably fit in a small window. Cause I just like was doing what I wanted again. There is, and, and I, I think I'm perceiving that you've experienced this multiple times firsthand and in reading. So, so ultra running is not something I've ever done. My only comparison to it is martial arts training, but we go through in martial arts training, these intense tests, right? Where we're certifying for different ranks that are designed to be much less about what we can physically do and much more about what we can convince and remind our, our body that we're capable of doing with our mind, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems like you had these moments. I remember I was reading one race where you, you had to run back up a hill because you forgot your, your poles, right? And you passed out and they wouldn't let you keep running. I mean, that sounds, one, I'd love for you to share that story with our audience. And two, the ability to go through that and then finish the race is absolutely crazy. Like that transcends what we think we're capable of. Yeah, it was so, it was a really crazy experience. And I think a really important experience for me. So I just come off of that six weeks off. Um, and I decided I really wanted to do UTMB, um, which UTMB, so there's two point systems. You have a point system, you have to have 15 points based on different races. They're like basically qualifying races to make sure you're fit enough and strong enough to run this sure. UTMB. Um, and then there's a point system based on, uh, performance. So I, and that, if you rank high enough, you get to bypass the lottery, Okay. Um, cause there's a, there's so many, this race has 2,600 people and so many wow. people apply that it's still only like a 30% entrance rate. Um, yeah. Um, I was really lucky based on past performances. I got to bypass the lottery and I was emailing the race director, basically begging to get in. And he was like, okay, you can have a spot. You're really late and a pain in my ass, but fine. <laughs> you have, but first you have to run this race in July in Iger or in the, it's called Iger Ultra Trail, so in Switzerland, to go um, uh, to get the, the qualifying points. Yeah. And I'm like, great, <laughs> you know, Switzerland, <laughs> I've never been. No training, again, you know, going back to the old cat stuff, no training, <laughs> but like this crazy, you know, I, I don't know what I'm getting into. I've never been to Europe before. I've never traveled by myself before. Yeah. And so I like, so I talked to him, I'm emailing him and the next week I'm on a plane about to go run wow. after not running for six weeks. <laughs> my coach is kind of like, uh, okay. <laughs> um, but so he and I were talking and we were like, there's no, you can't, uh, race for performance on this one. Mm -hmm. You can't you, like, you're not fit in that race for points. If you race for performance, you're going to get yourself hurt. Mm. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, I, I told him I would do it, but then I, uh, you know, in your mind, you have secret goals and I definitely had some. Um, and I, uh, um, so I get there and like, it's a lot bigger than us trail races. It's my first exposure, like the spec there's thousands and thousands of spectators out there. Wow. Um, and, uh, they get me on stage the night before a race and they're like, she's going to win the race. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh my God. And <laughs> no not pressure. Only that, but I'm like, it's pumping my ego. You know, I'm on stage. Yeah. There's every, it's a mandatory meeting. So there's 3000 people. I've never been on a stage in front of 3000 people. And I'm like, I, I for, part of me is like dying a little bit inside. And part of me is like puffing up my chest. Like, yeah, maybe I could win this tomorrow. <laughs> totally. And, um, and then I, um, uh, start and I feel really good and, um, and, and going pretty effortlessly. And it's my first time using trekking poles in a race because in European yeah. racer races, it's pretty standard because it's a lot of, um, really, really steep, steep, long mm. climb. Um, and then I, uh, so I, you know, I'm running the first 20 miles really strong, you know, I'm really rocking the climbs and, um, 
the descents, the European women are very quick on the descents, but I mm. am catching them back on the climbs and I'm um, feeling good. I'm like bouncing back between second and third. First is like, I can see first. Um, and then we all top three, me and two other women, the two who ended up getting one and two, um, go and head into the 35 K aid station after this really long, long climb, like yeah. fucking 7,000 feet of climbing. We're 10 miles in and we've already climbed 12,000 feet, <laughs> um, 20 miles, 12,000 feet in about four hours. And I'm, as I get to the top of the climb, I'm like, huh, I think I'm bonking. I don't feel great. Yeah. And, um, so I get there and I like have kind of a rough moment and I eat some food. I sit down but I don't want to lose one and two. Um, so I see them leave and it go, it's a steep descent. And I'm like, if I lose them on this descent, it's game over. I'm losing yeah. them. And you know, I'm, again, my coach is in the back of my head. Don't race, <laughs> shut him <laughs> off. <laughs> um, uh, then, uh, decide, you know, to go get them. I make it about I decide to go chase them down this descent. I'm chasing. I'm like barely hanging on on this downhill. They're crushing it. Yeah. And um, I realize I forget my poles up there, my trekking poles. So the thing about European races is if you start with trekking poles, you have to end with them no matter what, or else you get DQ'd um, or disqualified. And so I, uh, so I was like, oh God, no. And I sprinted back up the hill as hard as I could to try and get these poles yeah. and um I got to the top and I I was redlining you know I was which you should never do in a 100k race I was redlining and I reached down to grab the poles and I just passed out you know mm. it's never happened to me really before and you know I looked up and I all of a sudden like the, there's 20 people around me making sure I'm okay you know um the doctor, I like try and get my stuff and to keep going. And she's like, no, 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 no. You're staying right here. It was a little bit of a language barrier with the doctor. Her name's Tatiana, but we have time. She keeps, she's like, okay, you have to stay there for, if you are first, they try and get me to leave the race. I'm fighting. And they're like, okay, if you stay for two hours um, and you're still okay, then we'll let you go. And they said two hours because the next descent is about two hours. It'll, it's a long technical descent and it's about two hours till the next aid station. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's a long time. So they wanted to make sure that wasn't going to happen again for at least two hours. Um, ate a bunch of food, ate a whole bowl of potatoes, meat sauce, you know, wasn't going to do it. Called my boyfriend, Ryan, um, was like, Brian, I don't want to finish. Uh, I'm basically looking for excuses not to finish, you know, and he's like, you need to keep going. Um, I called my friend, Sean, when he said, I need to keep going. Sean was like, you're going to finish. You have no reason not to. I'm like, crap. Um, I I know my coach would tell me to stop, but he's asleep because it's 2 AM in the the U S and then, um, uh, then this lady, Andrea Hooser, comes in, who Andrea has won UTMB before. She's a stout athlete. She's won this trail race, Iger Ultra Trail, before. And she comes in. She has a big broken arm. And um, she, like, talks to the doctor. We know each other from – she ran Western States the year I did, so we know each other mm-hmm. from that. And I was like, Andrea, what, were, what would you do? And <laughs> she didn't quite understand that I'd fainted at the time, but she was like, <laughs> well, I'd faint. And <laughs> – um, cause she's Swedish. There's a language barrier. And she was like, well, I would finish. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> I guess I'm going to finish this then. And I, um, you know, and I just get going. I'm, I'm in a 104th place when I leave the aid station, I decide I want to go top 10. Um, and, uh, you know, tech, I texted my coach and I was like, Hey, is this still possible? She's like, no, stop it. <laughs> um, and I try, um, but I ran as hard as I could and I ran my own race and it was super hard being out of that. And I really, it was hard because like, I really, after being on stage the day before, then being yeah. like this Cap Bradley is going to win the race. Hey, 3000 people, this is the winner. I <laughs> call it already. <laughs> you know, it was really hard to swallow that pill and to still finish and I think that's what was holding me back at the aid station but I think it was really really valuable for um uh UTMB yeah. so 
this this idea of the process, right? We we hear this term and we share it, right? From a from a training perspective of control what you can control, focus on the process. What strikes me is maybe a, a really unique place to have to live and literally, you know, die by that is is ultra running because you are constantly there's people next to you running with you, passing you, you're stopping, you're starting, you know, in a lot of team sports or even individual sports where we talk about the process, it's stop and start, but it's these kind of really finite moments, right? Okay, there's a set, there's a play, there's this kind of short burst and then pause. Uh You're running almost a day straight and you're having to remind yourself every step, trust that. What do you do to stay focused on what's in your control? Um, You know, I start every race with, if I'm, if I'm gonna, if I'm running it right, I start every race With the only goal, it sounds cheesy, but I swear to God, with the only goal is to do the best that I can personally do. Mm. Yeah, I want to be competitive. Yeah, I want to, um, yeah, I I want to win, you know. Um, Mm. But if I, you know, there's no way I can be dissatisfied if I give 100% and end up wherever. And UTMB is a great example of that because I, you know, I did relatively well at that race, but it's not representative of the day. I had Mm. one of the worst days of running of my whole life. (laughs) Everything, everything went wrong, but it gave me a lot of opportunities to refocus, to reset, to be like, okay, I haven't had food for five hours. What am I going to do? Yeah. Can I bounce back from that? Yes, you can bounce back from that. It's okay. It's a long race. Then like other stuff happen. You have to be like, can I bounce back from this? Yes. You know, am I in real danger? Probably not. You know, and that I had to do that over and over again. Each time you ask yourself that question, you're refocusing on the goal just to get to the finish line the best you can. And on that day, I, I could not have given anything else, you know, and Mm. even though like, on paper, if someone told me before the race, I might not be super satisfied with the result. But just because, you know, the race went so poorly and I still was able to pull it together for a podium, like I'm, I've never been so proud of anything running wise, you know. So that's, yeah. that's, yeah. What do you learn about yourself in those moments, right? And, and has it, has it started to change for you from when you first started, right, with, with the, the first time you were in the bear? Has it changed in terms of these, you know, I've heard you talk before about the micro decisions that are required when you're running a race like this. Like these things that you learn about yourself when you do go five hours without eating and have to figure out what to do. When you do have these moments where you're, you're kind of, you're constantly being pushed to an edge that maybe you're not sure you can go past. What have you learned about yourself in that process? Totally. Um, well, with the bear 100, um, from to UTMB, you know, I've learned what I've learned about myself and the approach that I've taken in these moments has been, you know, has really evolved. Um, and it's been super, you know, awesome and painful at times and cool (laughs) times and like frustrating, Um, but when I started this sport and around the time of bear 100, I was like a stubborn finish at all costs kind of thing. And I kind of muscled my way through these races, which is really hard to do, you know, (laughs) Uh, and it's a lot of suffering. Like the bear 100 meant like off no training. I, um, you know, every obstacle I just like, I rolled my ankle the week before really bad and it started like this big and purple. And I just... You know, I was just like, F it, nothing's going to get me, stop me from the finish line. And I rolled it a bunch of times and I cried for about four hours, (laughs) but I didn't stop moving forward (laughs) where then I went through a period and, you know, I was at that time, I was kind of known for like, you know, taking like the only thing I can compare it to is like punching a wall, you know, when you're angry, like that's the kind of force that was taking me forward. Um, like that saying, you get angry and then you run faster. Um, and I still get that a little bit, but it's kind of evolved. It's, you know, evolved from more, um, definitely a healthier approach. You know, at first I, mm-hmm. when this whole, when it started as my career, you know, I kind of lost that toughness a little bit. Um, yeah. Cause I was like, well, is it worth 
injuring myself for the next race. And, you know, and then I kind of felt like I lost my identity because I was known to be this tough, like wall punching, angry runner. And then I felt like I lost my identity a little bit in that. And then, um, at UTMB, I got to really see it evolve and being, um, more less getting, I mean, I still got angry, but instead of, um, like forcing my way through the race, no matter what, I kind of was able to problem solve a little bit better and like Mm -hmm. roll with the punches and kind of, um, move with the terrain and with the problems instead of against the problems, you know, um, which I think is much healthier (laughs) and probably a lot safer. So it's cool. It's been cool evolving, you know, with that progression and evolving as an athlete. And, you know, when that's also like, I think a sign of just maturity in general, I was 23 when I did the bear, you know, yeah. now I'm 26, you know, it's that just like you, I think you grow a lot. And I, I found myself just like a lot of personal growth in my twenties. And it's been cool to apply that to myself as an athlete. It's, it's incredible. And, and I think, well, the reason I asked that question, and and it's cool that you tied in the emotions there, because I, I have this quote written down that I heard you say, you know, I knew at that moment I'd have to go to some dark places and to, to finish the race. And and it was so, uh, it was really fascinating because I think as athletes, sometimes we're not necessarily comfortable figuring out how to talk about the the light and the dark that's required in those moments at times, right? And and to hear that you're, you're evolving through that still, I think it's probably energizing to a lot of athletes, not sure what to do with all those emotions. Totally. And I think I'll always evolve um, as an athlete, particularly how I face those dark moments, because it's, you know, it's tough. And, you know, it's sometimes like it's hard to figure out why you're doing it, you know, when you're (laughs) when you're doing it. Um, It's easy before and after the race. But when you're facing like, oh, oh, man, this is going to be really hard. Um, It's hard to figure out the why. So I think like that why as I get older will always change. So, and it's cool to see that change and it's cool doing things like this, like really organic conversations about, you know, um, myself as an athlete, because I, I actually realize a lot of stuff in these podcasts. Which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's great. Uh, so, so here's an interesting question that, that is related a little bit to this. You know, we, we see mirrors everywhere, right? And as athletes, I think sometimes performance for us becomes this, whether we realize it or not, this mirror for what we're dealing with as people. And I didn't know until doing the research for, for you, like I didn't know that pacing was the, a thing in ultra running, right? So that you have, you'll have partners run with you. That was fascinating to me. What how does that feel if you're deep into a race and you're, you know, I mean, is, is it energizing? Is it frustrating? Is it, like, what is that relationship like? To have a pacer, it really depends on where you're at mentally and uh, who the pacer is. So let yeah. me just say European races, you can't have a pacer for any of Interesting. those. Interesting. So. Okay. UTMB and all Iger Ultra Trail and any European race you can't have. But yeah. U.S., it's a unique thing in U.S. trail racing. Um uh, just like it's a safety thing and uh, a, definitely a competitive edge. Yeah. Um, so it really depends on where I'm at mentally and um, the pacer himself. So I, uh, at Western States, for example, I had uh, Ryan Lassen, which is my boyfriend, Ryan Smith, who is a good friend of ours. We lived together for two years and um, with him and his wife, Soke. And uh, he's a, he's gotten eighth at UTMB as well. Okay. Um you know, he's a solid, solid athlete. And, um, he's the kind of guy that gives no love, you know, when you're racing, no sympathy. You know, he told me he was proud of me at the end of Western States. And I think that's the most emotion I've ever seen out of him, but like super awesome. I know he cares about me deep down. It's just, (laughs) you have to run really hard to get it out of him. Um, so, and then Ryan, who's, you know, my partner, in life and like can kind of take the pressure off what I'm doing. You know, I can talk to him and it's fun and it's just like a normal run, normal day. So like that contrast works really, really well for me, especially in a race like Western. So my Ryan, Ryan Lassen took me from uh, mile 60 to 80 or so, or like 75. Um, And that was like a really good section for like, I was leading at the time and it was a really good section to like chit chat and like take the pressure off for a couple hours. You know, we're just running right now. It's too early to compete. 
And then Ryan Smith took me to the finish. For, so oh. around 80 to the fin- or like 85 or 75 to the finish. So 25 miles. And, you know, at that point you had to race. I had an Olympian at my back, the 2008 marathon, Magda Lena Bolette, a former winner of Western States. So I really had to turn on. Um, and so Smith was really, you know, no emotion, no, um, uh, no, like he won't empathize with you. If you're like, this hurts really bad. He won't be like, Oh, I'm so sorry. He'll be like, suck it up. You know, I tried to walk a hill at one point in that section. He was like, cat, you're better than that. <laughs> and so that was what I needed at that point. But in contrast, I have a really good friend, Sean, um, who I started this sport with, who paced me at 100K recently, and it wasn't going so well. I still I ended up winning, but it was just like a bad race. And, yeah. um, you know, he's like my brother. So, like, that brotherly, like, I want to kill you kind of came out. <laughs> and I just <laughs> gave up the race, you know. So it really depends on the person and, like, where you're at mentally and, um, uh but it's interesting. UTMB was my first 100 mile race without a pacer. I, yeah. I don't, I can't tell you now if I like it better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I find so just the conversations we have with ourselves, right? In these moments where we are completely by ourselves going through just absolute pain and suffering and intensity. I would imagine having a pacer allows you to get out of your head for a little bit and allows you to get more external and have kind of that, that, that ability to bounce back and forth. But I could also see it drawing your focus away too. So it, it just seemed like a really interesting dynamic to navigate. Oh, and it, again, like it, it depends, like it can draw your focus away. Like, but sometimes that's good. Like with, yeah. when Ryan Lassen took me, I really needed someone to pull me out of like, cause I, I, I was winning this huge race and it was, you know, we were, we still have 40 miles left. And I was like, man, can I hold this lead for that long? Right. Um, so I really needed at that moment, someone to take me out of my head, but um, Ryan Smith really helped me focus and keep the gas on the whole time. So like, again, it depends the relationship and it depends where you're at. How has your relationship to coaching evolved since you started? Um, in what way? Like, well, so coach, I coach athletes or, um, I guess specifically in what you, so did you have a coach when you started and, and from what I saw, it sounds like coaching was a, was a kind of a specific strategy that you sought out. So what made you say, okay, this is going to let me take the next level or grow in the way I need to. Yeah. So I actually didn't really seek out coaching. Um, but there is this coach uh, his name's David Roach, um, who, uh, really saw after me, which was cool. And it was, and I had, I had done nothing at this point besides the bear 100. And I, um, led for 60 miles of run rabbit run before DNFing and, yeah. um, DNFing run rabbit run. Uh, he reached out to me and was like, Hey, I, and he'd reached out to me right before this because I ran the 50 K national championships and he was there and he ran it as well. And he saw me, and I was doing really well. I was like in the top five for the first 20 something miles. And, you know, I'm celiac and I was getting a little, I was with some college friends the night before and was getting a little frisky with what I was drinking. Um, I was drinking like some real beer. I was like, Oh, I'll taste it and spit it out. I'll be fine. And so stupid idea before and I, I just ended up uh, having a loose, uh, my bowels, I had no control them i'll put it like that um, yeah sure um, uh, and uh he saw me at that race and actually um then i dnf'd run rabbit run shortly after that and he reached out to me he was like please let me coach you let me because <laughs> i was just kind of a mess like went out hard blowing up you know pooping during races everywhere um uh and so <laughs> and so um then he reached out to me and it was a really good time because it was my first year with my own classroom mm-hmm. and i really needed structure and, uh, um, you know, someone to tell me to run more, which I wasn't running that I wasn't training that much. I was maybe doing like 30 miles a week and he got me safely up to like 70 miles a week as a peak, um, while working 60 hours a week. So that was huge. Um, uh, he was up before me every day. I wake, woke up at four 45. Um, so it was cool. It was a really, it's a really cool relationship. And, um, we still work together and, uh, um, 
it's been cool to see that relationship, you know, ebb and flow, you know, yeah. um, it's like, you know, when a coach, it's like a, a friend or like a, it's a, it's a relationship. So like you yeah. go through times of like super, super peaks and then you, you know, you get to know each other in like a very intimate way, you know, um, which is cool. Yeah, and it seems like in a sport like ultra running, there's a there's a unique requirement on the part of the coach, right, to to understand the right levers to pull and push at different times for you, right? Because you're it just it seems like such a unique set of circumstances to try to either motivate or support or or push or pull back. That's a hard, I would imagine, dynamic to navigate. Yeah, and it's been interesting for him because he like really had to push at first, you know, because mm. I was teaching and he saw a lot of talent and I was like having a really hard time balancing running and work. So he had to be like, Kat, you need to get out and do this because you're, you could be really good. And that was before Western States. Um, and that was, you know, no one had ever told me that in ultra running before, you know, so it was cool. And then, um, Western States happen. To be fair, he didn't think I was going to win, but he was, um, <laughs> he was, um, Ryan, my boyfriend there. So there's this poll system right before the race, Western States and like thousands and thousands of people vote on who's going to win the race. And there's like this poll. And, uh, I, I had one vote that I was going to win and that was Ryan, <laughs> which is super cool. Um, but then, but then, uh, as a, professional athlete like David kind of had to pull me back and you know we kind of our re- relationship as coach and athlete you know kind of struggled a little bit um and then and then now we just started like back on track fully um and uh it's been really good and it's, you know so it's again I forget what the question was but um <laughs> that relationship has developed too and you know it's crazy <laughs> uh, no it's it's great and and so what, what comes to mind for me is this idea, and I think what sparked it was both the, the coaching relationship that ebbs and flows, and then the fact that you had to do a lot of this, at least at the start, while being a full-time teacher. So where have you seen your career and your you know, experience running either reflected in your personal life or, or whether you know, you've learned things from running that you've applied to your personal life or vice versa? Like where has that overlap occurred most uh, intensely for you? Totally. Um, so last year I was a little bit lost in what my purpose was. You know, I, I didn't have students anymore. I didn't, you know, I was just running. Yeah. Um, and that was hard. It led me to do too much. Um, I was like running every single one of my runs, like way too fast, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, just because I, I was a runner and that's what I had, I was a professional athlete. Um, and that was kind of my identity. Um, and then, you know, this year I, you know, I really, it just kind of happened organically when I stopped running for six weeks, I've kind of been able to put purpose behind my platform Mm -hmm. again, you know, getting more women into the sport is really a huge, huge, um, thing for me. Like I would love to do whatever I can with this platform to get women into trail and ultra running specifically. Um, and also I, I, I started coaching a little bit, you know, I let myself, uh, have a year trial with my PT. Um, David has actually been trying to get me to coach forever. Um, for, you know, just a, like a year and a half now, he's been trying to get me to take on athletes because he just, you know, I know a lot about coaching. I've studied a lot about uh, coaching uh, methodologies and, um, and he just thought I'd be a good fit. And I, uh, so, you know, so, I, but I wasn't sure I wanted to take on some people for free, some friends for free, just to see how it went. And I coached my PT to his first 50 K and a couple of friends. Um, I coached Ryan and I, uh, and I really, really liked it. So I just took on, um, a few athletes and, you know, it's still really small, but I, I also like, I find a lot of joy in that, yeah. um, which is cool. Do you find that maybe connects a little bit of the, the piece of teaching that you love to, and being able to share and, and help guide that knowledge and that transformation? Totally. Both, uh, both, uh, speaking, getting women more involved in the sport and coaching really gives me that same outlet that teaching does. You know, I lead all these how to trail run clinics to like (laughs) make women more comfortable and trail running. And that gives me that outlet that I love teaching and leading. And, um, you know, 
speaking to a group and then coaching is that same thing. You know, I get to hold someone's hand essentially through like their running career. That's, and that's super, super important to them. And it's cool that I can make it important for me too. Um, yeah. What is the, what is the, the gap that you see kind of holding back more women from jumping into, into trail running? Like what, as you look at the landscape, where does the growth need to happen? So there's two reasons, I think. Um, yeah. The first reason it's just kind of, so there were more men runners for a long, long time. Actually now women have kind of surpassed. This is just runners in general, you know, until like the seventies or it, when, when the running boom of the seventies happened, it was just basically men. And there's a very small percentage of women's runner, women runners. And I think that trail running has just kind of followed that trend. You know, men got into it first and then women are slowly filtering in. Um, and it's just like the pattern. And soon I think women in the sport will overtake men if it, or if it upholds the same pattern as running does yeah. uh, running did in general as a whole, but also, I, so talking to individuals in these clinics that I lead or in talks that I do, um, I've uh, noticed that women are a little bit more timid to mm. go out on the trails. And I will say a lot of times that's, provoked by um like men have told me at 50ks before like that national 50 na national championship 50k some like guy told me he's like i didn't know women were strong enough to go run the wilderness like mm -hmm. stuff like that and so i think those comments and i've gotten comments like that kind of a lot um as a young woman and it's uh, i think to a lot of you know there's either two ways to react you can be like i'll show you or you can be like, maybe he's right. May, you know, the woods are scary. There's a lot of animals out there. Um, so I think that's a huge thing too. It's just a lot, you know, people shouting it, you know, and it's less and less, but people telling women what they can and can't do. Like, oh, I didn't know women were brave enough to go in the woods. I got that so many times when I hiked the Appalachian Trail, especially in the South. Um, <laughs> um, but I think that too kind of plants a seed in a lot of people's heads. Like maybe he's right, you know? So, um, I want, and you know, my message to new female trail runners is, you know, it's good to do things that scare you a little bit, okay. you know, it's UTMB scared the hell out of me. I've never <laughs> been so scared for anything in my life. Um, but you, you grow as a person doing that. Even if you just go for like, a 30 minute trail run with a friend, you know, and that's super scary. You're going to come out from that and you're going to be like, man, that was so cool. I just did something hard. I just did something that I was really scared to do. And you'll likely do it again. Second thing, I, the, my second message, it's really unlikely that something's going to happen. Bring a mm. cell phone, bring all the gear you think you're going to need. We make really, everyone makes really awesome running packs now. Yeah. Chances are you'll be safe. You know, if you're smart, you, you'll be safe. I would imagine there is such a, you know, in, in a difference between, say, going for a 30-mile run just in the city versus going for a even just a couple-mile run in the trails, the difference in how you feel afterward, I'd imagine, is drastically different. They've done, you know, there's there's so much research to show force bathing, right? The, the impact that has on our just mental health in general. I would imagine running the same thing, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um and I notice that like, even in the winter time, I do a lot more road running and I'm like, why am I so agitated all the time? And it's because mm. I just didn't get that outlet outside. I didn't get to feel disconnected from yeah. everything going around. Cause you know, especially now with cell phones, we're so connected all the time. And we go out into the woods, even if it's just your local foothills and yeah. you're around trees, you, even if you're like can, a mile from the city, you feel really secluded. And I think that is a really important, really awesome feeling. <laughs> Kat, this has been absolutely incredible. We are, we're, we're running up on time. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, before I ask my final question here, where can these guys go to connect with you online? Cool. Um, I'm at, at Kat B Rad on Instagram. So C-A-T-B-E-R-A-D, you know, kind of a play on Kat Bradley on Instagram. Um, I write a weekly fitness column for uh, btrtoday.com. So breakthroughradio.com. And that's always on my um Instagram and my Facebook page. And my Facebook page is just Kat Bradley. Um, and it'll be a picture of me 
<laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay. So, so our final question, this show is called I'm the athlete because we are, we, we want to understand what it takes to be the ultimate mind, body, and spirit athlete. So what does being on the athlete mean to you? Um, you know, drawing off our conversation earlier, I really feel like it, uh, it's those defining mo- like how you proceed in those defining moments. How do you, when you're facing 12 hours of really hard running or you're going out, you're like pulled up to the trailhead for your first run ever, trail run ever, and you're in the car and you're like, man, I'm scared out of my mind. You know, it's how, what, how you react in those moments. How do you face it and, you know, cope with the fear or do you turn around, you know, and I think to facing it and being okay with being scared and being okay with failure is um, really really how I would define. I, I always strive for that. So that's how I would define being an omni-athlete. That's awesome. Guys, go, wow, Kat, this has been incredible. Guys, go check out Kat's content and just the energy she's sharing online. It is absolutely incredible. And I can't use that word enough. There is such a level of transparency and authenticity that you will see when you go read her content and check out her Facebook and Instagram posts. Like, as an athlete who is constantly being forced to deal with the internal conversations that so many of us as athletes are able to maybe at times ignore because our sport requires such external feedback constantly back and forth, there is just a level of raw authenticity and vulnerability that is so energizing. And you're going to experience that right away when you dive into Cat's World. So go check out her content online, follow her. It's If it doesn't make you want to run, it will at least make you want to understand better why you're doing what you're doing. And until next time, guys, thank you for watching this episode of Omni Athlete. Hey, hey, what is up, guys? Thank you for watching another episode of Omni Athlete. Please, please, please go like and subscribe to our podcast. That is our goal right now is just to build this community as big as we possibly can. And we need your help to do it. So like and subscribe, share our content, guys. If if this content adds any value to your world that helps you perform, connect, go deeper, go wider, Whatever it is that it does for you, if it provides value, all we ask is that you share our content and help grow this community. We can't accomplish our goal of elevating global consciousness through sport without you. You are an integral part of this mission and this purpose, and we need your help. So please go like, subscribe, and share our content and continue to help us build and grow this community that is truly motivated to not just elevate consciousness, but elevate and shift the very culture of sport so that we can truly experience the athletic experience in a brand new and energizing way for so, so many people, guys. So thank you. And please like and subscribe. Until next time.